Welcome to the Norris Group Real Estate Podcast, a show committed to bringing you insights from thought leaders shaping the real estate industry. In each episode, we'll dive into conversations with industry experts and local insiders, all aimed at helping you thrive in an ever-changing real estate market, continuing the legacy that Bruce Norris created, sharing valuable knowledge, and empowering you on your real estate journey. Whether you're a seasoned pro or a newcomer, this is your go-to source for insider tips, market trends, and success strategies. Here's your host, Craig Evans. You know, we've, we've got our, uh, our educational event, uh, elevate coming up in June out in, in California. And, and I know, you know, I was out there last year for that when Bruce was, uh, was hosting the last one that he had hosted and. Um, you know, I had several conversations with people about, uh, structure of business and how I was growing my businesses and how I formed things. And if you were guiding them, at what point should the real estate investment world be thinking about and planning on asset preservation? Well, I, I mean, look, I, I think, I, I think asset preservation is something that should be thought about at the very beginning of asset accumulation, right? Because, Asset preservation is easier to accomplish as you accumulate rather than looking backward after you've accumulated a bunch of things and now it all needs to be retitled um, and, and, a, and, and a plan needs to be put in place. So, so look, does it absolutely unequivocally have to be thought about at the beginning? No, but if someone were to say, look, this is where I'm going. This is what I plan on doing. I'm going to buy this particular piece of property. I'm going to build a rental property. I'm going to put a tenant in there. I'm going to let the market appreciate. I'm going to have it cash flow, and I'm going to keep doing it over and over again. I would tell that person, well, okay, let's talk about your current assets. We know where you're going. What do you have now? And where do you see yourself in, in a couple of years as you exercise this, this plan of yours? And I would tell them that, you know, if, if, at a certain level, you know, that, that, the time is probably now to at least put in some type of asset preservation structure. And look, it may come to the point where if they're extraordinarily successful, that the current plan becomes antiquated and would need to be changed into something a little bit more complicated. But, um, you know, you, you start small, but you at least have a plan in place. Because then, because look, I always tell people, no one likes to think about their own demise, right? No one likes to, to yep. think about it, talk about it. Uh, it. Generally, as a topic, it sucks. Okay, but what I tell people <laughs> is is think about it like a like a partnership agreement, right? You have a partnership agreement. You put that document in a drawer, right? And then you go about exercising whatever the partnership is about. You're working in the day to day. You don't think about it. The document's there. You know what your rights, duties, and obligations are. And if you have to pull it out of the drawer and read it every once in a while, you can. But you really, on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't obsess and stew over it. A will or a trust or some type of estate planning vehicle is the same thing. You have it. You know it's there. You know there's a base level of protection, but you're not going to look at it every day. You put it in your safe. You know, you, you, you tell your kids where it's located or your spouse, and you leave it alone. And then you go about your life. But at least if, God forbid, something unexpected happens to you, there's at least a plan in place. So, and what that plan is so, depends on where they reside, what their net worth is, what they've accumulated, what they're planning on doing. So I, it, it's a very, very individualized discussion. Young or old, right? Whether it's beginning investor, seasoned investor, what do you see as some of the biggest mistakes that they make when it comes to asset preservation? It, it, I guess it's difficult to characterize them as mistakes, right? But look, I mean, when we do probate work, for someone that has recently deceased, right? And they have all these things that now have to go through a, a, a court proceeding for the succession to go to heirs and, and things. And it, I mean, it, it costs a lot of time and it costs money, right? Um, whereas if, you know, they had taken the time to put those assets into a revocable trust, for example, their, their successor trustee would already be in control of the asset, handling the asset. There would have been no court intervention really to speak of. Um, 
and it would have been a, a, a much more seamless transition. So, you know, I, I, I think for, for the vast majority of the people that are probably going to listen to this podcast, a revocable trust with a pour over will um, would, would do a, a lot of positive things, right? Um, because it would provide for that, that, um, that seamless uh, transition to the, to the next, you know, to the heirs uh, of the particular assets without having to get too involved with, with a court. Um, and it provides immediate access to those assets and to the bank accounts. But look, well, the biggest, okay, we want to talk about mistakes. The biggest mistake I see are when people form a trust, but then they never actually put any of their assets in it. <laughs> you have to actually transfer <laughs> assets to the trust. I'm like, oh, you had a trust. That's wonderful. So what do you own? Oh, we own this and we do this and this and this. I said, okay, well, um, what, when was it transferred into the trust? Blank stare. You have a trust, but you haven't <laughs> put the stuff into the trust. <laughs> so that's the, the biggest mistake, I guess. If you want to call up if there's a mistake, that's the one. If you're going to spend the money to go ahead and, and, and execute the estate plan, finish the execution. If you take care of it and, and just stay a little bit diligent, it, it doesn't it doesn't have to cost the world. But man, it saves you a ton of time and a ton of money in the event that something goes wrong. Well, and look, I can tell you what what myself and and, and my wife have, right? So you know, we we have a revocable trust with a pour over will, and 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 let me explain to your listeners what a pour over will is, right? Invariably, people will forget about something in their that, that's not titled in their trust. And a pour over will, the beneficiary of the will is the trust. And so if you own anything that isn't already in the trust, the will, just like it sounds, pours it into the trust. You still have to probate that asset, but it's a fairly simple probate because all you're doing is conveying it over to the trust and then you administer the trust, right? So a pour over will is kind of the catch all. You obviously want to avoid having to use the pour over will, but it's there in case you make a mistake, right? Right. So I have a, a revocable trust with a pour over will. I also own, um, I have a limited liability company of which the sole member is my trust. And so anything that's owned by the limited liability company ends up in the trust because the trust owns the membership interest in the limited liability company. So I get the corporate shield of a, of a corporate entity, but I also get the estate planning vehicle of, of those assets technically being owned by my trust because the trust owns the LLC. That's what I have. And it, it's not a, a complicated structure. Um, it, it probably would fit, like I said, the vast, vast majority of the people that are gonna listen to this podcast. Um, and, um, uh, you know, but look, if you get to a certain net worth or a certain level of accumulation, a more complex tax component strategy where you're possibly going to exceed the, the federal exemption on the value of your estate, um, then you get into a, a, a different level of things, you know, generation skipping trusts and things like that. Um, but you know, A, I don't, I don't, that's not necessarily what I would need at this point in my life. And my suspicion sure. is, is that very, very few of the people that, that, that will listen to the podcast would be, you know, kind of in that, in that, that realm. So for, for either the new investors coming into this world that are listening and wanting to learn or seasons and seasoned investors that may be coming from a different state that, uh, that have been advised, uh, differently. Um, do you, from an investor standpoint, do you prefer, and, and if so, why an, an LLC or a, a corporation? So, so look, I, I will tell you, I have always preferred LLCs over corporations, primarily not from an estate planning standpoint, but from a liability shield standpoint. Okay. And let me explain to you why. And let me explain to you some of the nuances that have developed in the law 
over the last decade that, that people need to be aware of. So if, if you end up where someone gets a judgment against you, right, and they're now looking to collect their judgment, if you have stock in a corporation, that stock is attachable or seizable. In other words, you owe me $100,000 and you own stock in ABC Inc., right? And that stock could be worth something. Um, I, and I have no other means to collect from you. Um, I can petition the court to seize your stock as a means of either paying or partially paying the judgment debt that you owe to me, right? Limited liability me company membership interests are different, okay? Corporate stock, seizable. Membership interest in a limited liability company, not necessarily seizable, okay? And I'll explain what I mean by not necessarily in a moment. Um, the way it traditionally worked is if, again, I've got a judgment against you, Okay, for a hundred thousand, you own membership interests in ABC LLC. I can't seize your membership interests; they're not seizable. That that's that that's what makes limited liability companies unique. What I can do is I can serve on the LLC a charging lien as to any distributions that the LLC would make to you who owe me the judgment debt. Right, but as I mentioned earlier. 99% of all LLCs are closely held family companies. The workaround on that charging lien is you just never make a distribution to yourself. You pay all of your bills through the LLC, so there's never any money to distribute. So it renders the charging lien completely worthless. Okay. Now, okay. let me explain to you some of the nuances that have, that have, have happened in... I, I guess we're going on 10 years now, Craig. Every time I tell the story, I have to add a, a couple more years to it, right? But, uh, you know, about, about 10 years ago, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeal based out of Atlanta, which covers the state of Florida, um, Federal Appeals Court, was examining the a bankruptcy case out of the Northern District of Florida, which I, I want to say it was based out of Jackson. And ultimately, to summarize, the appellate court took the position that membership interests in single-member LLCs for judgment collection purposes are going to be treated like stock in a corporation. In other words, it's seizable. Okay? Okay. And, and so if you own a single member LLC. In other words, you own ABC LLC as Craig Evans, an individual, 100%. And I get a judgment debt. You owe me a judgment debt of 100,000. I can go to the court and petition to seize or attach your membership interest in that LLC because you're the only member, okay? And so that's okay. what that appellate court ruling ultimately determined. We're gonna treat single member LLCs uh, and the membership interest in those single member LLCs, just like stock in a corporation for judgment collection purposes. All right. Look, it's an easy fix because you just make it a multi-member LLC. Right. Um, sure. And, and, I mean, look, and again, I don't want to scare people because it has to do with, you know, you have to balance what your level of risk is based upon what you're actually doing through that corporate entity. As I mentioned earlier, Currently, my limited liability company is owned solely by my revocable trust because what I'm doing through that corporate entity is all passive income things. There's no real liability exposure, right? But if I'm actively renting properties and I've got tenants and God only knows who the tenants are inviting and even though I have insurance, what if somebody you know is horrifically maimed or injured or killed? I want to shield my personal assets including my membership interest in the LLC that owns the real estate, a multi-member LLC is, is the way to go. 
So for, for those listening, I guess, um, I mean, you know, we, we see there, there's a million things online where you can go and you can create your own LLC. It's, it's pretty easy. If you, if you know how you can go and create them right from state websites, that type of stuff. But, um, you know, what role does a lawyer role and play in that? I, I mean, you know, I, I know what role you play for me, uh, but for, for those listening, you know, what role can you play and how do you make that easy? And how, how do you handle that? If somebody new is coming to you, how do you walk them through the determination? Is it single member? Or is it not, it, you know, the whole process, what, what does that look like for you guys? So, I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm the person in the office that, that uh, oversees the department that does those things, right? We, every week we're meeting with people that want to discuss the right corporate entity for whatever business venture they're doing, how to set that up. Um, we have the discussion about liability protection. We have the discussion about succession um, and whether that's a relevant conversation. We at least have the conversation if they don't want to really address it right now, we at least kind of lay it out for them so they know what the path forward would be if they want to then form a trust or, or, or something along those lines. Um, and, and we kind of talk through it very similarly to what we've just done here on this podcast. You know, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm giving you kind of the broad brush, um, yeah. you know, scenario, but it's a much more individualized conversation because I have to know the people that I'm representing and what, what they're, what they're planning on doing, what their goals are, because there are nuances that, uh, that need to be taken into consideration. So, uh, I, I know for, I think every entity that I own, I think you, if I'm not mistaken, you are my registered agent, uh, get that, get asked that a lot T tell people the registered agent, what is it? Who is it? What, what does it serve that process? So in Florida, every corporate entity, whether it's a corporation, an LLC, um, needs to have what's known as a, a registered agent and a registered agent is a Florida based non PO box address and person that can accept service of process or other important documents um, for the company or the corporate entity. Okay. So for example, if Craig Evans owns ABC LLC and Frank Aloya is the registered agent, an ABC LLC gets sued uh, for, you know, an unpaid utility bill, for example, right? They can serve me, the registered agent, with that lawsuit. Um, and look, a lot of my clients prefer that because they're like, hey, Frank, if I'm going to get sued for something, it might as well go to your office first anyway, because if it comes to me, I'm sending it to you anyway. So it just it eliminates right. a step. Um, you know, um, and then the other thing is, is that a lot of people um, like that because it helps them avoid having their personal address um, out there in, in the public domain as well. You know. But so to confirm, because I can't tell you how many people have thought that you and I are business partners because at one point or time, somebody's looked me up or things like that and said, oh, we see that your attorney is an owner of your business. Just, yeah, just no, to no, confirm, no. a registered no. agent is not an owner, right? I mean, <laughs> look, I mean, a, a, look, a registered agent can be an owner, right? But correct for ninety eight percent of the LLCs for which I'm the registered agent, I have no ownership interest in whatsoever. I'm literally the lawyer, and and in some instances, yeah. I'm just the lawyer that formed it. You know, I have instances where I form an entity for someone that I didn't have a prior, you know, business relationship with. They need a lawyer to form the corporate entity. I set it all up. I give them the thing. And then they're, you know, in the wind. And I don't necessarily hear from them for years, if ever again. But they keep renewing their, their LLC on their own. And I'm still the registered agent. And every once in a while, I'll get a, you know, certified letter or I get served with a lawsuit. And I'm like, hey, I know I haven't spoken to you in three years, but this was served on me as your registered agent. You may want to update your registered agent if we're not really actively working together anymore. You know, all of those renewal notices come to me as well because you've got to pay a renewal fee and do certain things with, for the state of Florida, the division of corporations every year. And so as the registered agent, I get those notices of renewal and I handle all of the renewals for hundreds of clients. They're like, we will pay you your annual fee. 
Well, you handle the renewal, Frank. You you put it on cruise control. I don't even want to think about it. Do you do that for any other LLCs that are outside of Florida? So the answer is yes. I mean, look, I have Florida-based clients that own Delaware entities, for example, that have to you know be renewed as a foreign entity doing business in the state of Florida and registered in the state of Florida. So I have to handle their renewals in Delaware, as well as their foreign entity status in Florida. Uh, and then, of course, I have, as you mentioned, I have clients all over the country that own Florida-based entities that I handle the renewals for them. And I know one of the questions that you have talked about that you get asked a lot, you know, especially with the people that are coming in from California and other, other states to our boot camps that we do throughout the year, uh, is you know, the, the difference between purchasing a home in, in, in an LLC or purchasing you using the trust, uh, kind of, kind of walk them through that. If it's just in a trust, not an LLC, just an LLC, not in a trust. And I know that's going back to some asset preservation and that whole process, but, uh, is there, is there anything that, that, that our listeners should be aware of in one versus the other? Well, okay. Or is that even too, is that even too general of a question? Let's start with the scenario of they're buying, let's say residential property um, through their trust, their existing, say California trust. You said California, we'll we'll say, let's say they have a, a, a revocable trust in California and they're buying this Florida residential property um, through their California revocable trust. Right. The first question, and they say, what do you think of that? I would say, well, the first question I would have for them is, well, what do you intend on doing with that Florida property? And if their answer is, oh, it's just a second home, it's just going to be us and, and our family. And, you know, because we're considering maybe spending part of the year in Florida, or maybe we're going to try Florida out and maybe leave California. If they're going to use it themselves, uh, or the, just their family and friends, and it's not an income-producing property, leaving it in their trust is probably just fine because the liability possibilities are so small under that scenario, right? But if they were to say, hey, Frank, well, no, our, our plan is we're going to find a tenant, we're going to rent it out, we're going to have it as an income stream, I, I would tell them that I don't love them owning an income producing property with third party tenants in their trust. I would probably advocate for them to form a limited liability company, for example, and that the limited liability company can be owned by their trust. It's still in their trust, but now there's that that corporate shield that protects their other trust assets if, you know, something cataclysmic were to occur. You've, you've talked about irrevocable trust several times. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, when, when someone says, well, look, I, I want to create something that can't be undone. Well, I'll give you the, 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 the most typical example, right? Um, husband and wife, second marriage, they're older. Um, they're, they're first spouses. They're either divorced or deceased. They have children and grandchildren of their own. They get, you know, uh, married to each other and they want to make sure that what they had accumulated prior to that marriage ends up with their heirs rather than their new spouse's heirs. Right. And so there are, you know, th- that's that's probably the most typical scenario where an irrevocable trust comes into play. In, in talking about what you do, one of the things that we haven't even mentioned today, you, you've got Atlas title. We've talked about it several times. Atlas title is not always the biggest money maker, right? Title companies are not just cash cows like everybody necessarily thinks they are. Uh, you know, obviously, depending on the size of deals that's going through them, things like that. But in 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 a traditional sense of a title company, unless it is its sole focus is just to hammer deal after deal after deal after deal day after day. Um, wh- why did it make sense for you from a business strategy to integrate a, a title company into what you guys do? Well, I'll be, I'll tell you, it's, it was more family based. So <laughs> I will, so as you know, I never joined my father's law firm, right? I'd already right. chosen my own path. And, um, and so 
later in his career, as, as Ty and I are now building, you know, I'd left the, 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 the national firm that I was with. Ty and I formed a, a lawyer in Roland, as it was known back in those days. Um, and I'm look, I don't need a title company. As, as a licensed attorney, I can, I can be a licensed title agent without having a title company. But the title company was a way that I could do a business venture with my father without us being involved in each other's law firms. And it was nice. It was a nice way to have a business venture with your father um, and, and, and still have your own kind of legal things, if you will. That's, that was really the rationale of how Atlas Title came to be. Now, I, I will tell you that there are certain states in this country where people will not close through a title company. New York, New Jersey, right. those are attorney states. They don't know title companies. They don't like title companies. They don't trust title companies. They're not familiar with them. They want to close through an attorney, which is fine. We can accommodate that. And then there are states that are it's just the opposite. Attorneys don't do those things. It's all done through a title company. And and so we, sure. we obviously can offer whatever people's um, you know personal preference is one way or the other. It doesn't cost any more or any less. You know, the people, what people don't understand is, is there's no, there's no real give in Florida title insurance. The title insurance rates are established by the Department of Insurance for the state of Florida. No one is legally allowed to charge any more or any less than what that promulgated rate is. I mean, that, that's, <laughs> it, it, they're just, you know, there, there's, there's a little bit of variation in you know people's closing fees, perhaps whether they upcharge certain title policy endorsements that there isn't a set thing on. You know we we basically do the, the the minimum stuff, but the actual main title insurance rate established by the state of Florida by law, and no one can charge any more or any less. The reason I wanted to ask that, I, I'll be honest, I did not know that it started with a a, a relationship for you and your father, and never knew that. And I think that's again cool when you start learning the history of you and your family. So. So as we're starting to wrap this up, there's a couple of things I wanted to just ask two, two quick things, but what's the biggest piece of advice you would give to a new investor? Well, I mean, look, I, I, I the, the, all of the mistakes in the real estate realm that I experience are because people went into things without getting legal advice on the front end. I can clean up a lot of messes. But generally, the messes that I clean up are completely and wholly avoidable. And the cleanup costs are always more expensive than the front end costs. Always. Always. So, look, it, it certainly doesn't have to be me, but uh, a trusted legal advisor, if you're going to start doing real estate investing, it is, is a very, very prudent way to proceed. Uh, so listen, the, the, the last thing is completely off of real estate. I, I know that to you and all your partners, giving back to the community is, is extremely important. You know, I know that a, a lawyer Roland supports a lot of nonprofits in the area. Uh, the, the attorneys that you've got in the firm, uh, uh, people on the, the, the American board of trail advocates, you got family resource centers, you got Valerie houses, just, just to name of the few, you know, you, you guys are extremely big with uh, community cooperative, uh, great, great, uh, you know, charity that does a lot of great things here, uh, you know, for, for people that are hungry. Right. Um, but I, I know that you personally serve on the board of trustees for the, for the Edison and Ford winter estates. Um, why is that one important for you to be a part of and to put your mark on? Well, it has a, a little bit of a family connection. I don't know if you and I've ever discussed this. Um, so, but I'll, I'll give you a couple of a couple of things. Obviously, as, as we talked about earlier, I, I love history, right? And one of the things that makes Fort Myers so very, very unique is that we were the winter home of Thomas Edison and Henry Ford, and they lived right next door to each other. They were they were they became great friends, and you have these two amazing historical men 
inventors and, 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 you know, just amazing industrialists, if you will, that ended up becoming next door neighbors and fast friends in little old Fort Myers. You know, Edison said, he goes, there's only one Fort Myers and someday millions and millions of people are going to hear about it. Well, it, it was prophetic, but, you know, back in those days, Fort Myers was a little spit of a town. Um, and, 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 and the family connection is, as I mentioned earlier, you know, my great grandfather, Michael Pavise was a barber with his brothers. Well, Michael Pavise was Mr. Edison's barber, um, when Mr. Edison was in town. Wow. And Mr. Edison didn't like to come to town much. And, um, so my, my great grandfather would actually walk from downtown Fort Myers to the Edison home and he would cut Mr. Edison's hair um, at uh, Mr. Edison's home there at the estate. And, and it was um, Mrs. Edison, Mina, um, was, was a very, very lovely woman. And at one point, you know, asked my great grandfather about, you know, his children or whatever. And my grandmother was the oldest of, of the four children. And, um, you know, Mrs. Edison said, look, if you've got, if you ever have to, you know, bring one of your kids, please feel free. And so my, my, my great grandfather took her up on that and he would actually walk my grandmother, uh, Francis, um, with him, uh, to the Edison home and, and Miss Edison, Mrs. Edison would give her, you know, lemonade and cookies while, while my great grandfather was cutting Mr. Edison's hair. So he had that little kind of, uh, and I heard those stories growing up. Um, and so you had that little family connection. And then, you know, when I was eh, pretty young in my legal career, um, the Edison and Ford homes were a very, very hot topic. Um, they had fallen into a certain level of disrepair. They were the income stream from the tourism, the gate receipts and, you know, gift shop stuff and whatnot was just kind of dumped into the city of Fort Myers you know, general fund. And it was very, very easy for the city to use that money and not put the money back into the estates. And so a number of, you know, um, longtime Fort Myers people obviously became very, very concerned about that because, you know, the Edison and Ford Winter Estates, A, make us unique, but also we're a significant driver of tourism dollars. I mean, we're one of the top five most visited historical figure homes uh, in the country. I, I, I think that, you know, like Mount Vernon and Monticello are one and two, and then Dearborn, Ford's place up in Dearborn is like number three. We're like four or five. Um, and so right. it was, a, and, 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 you know, you no homes and no tourists. And, and so those kind of, you know, leaders of the community led by my dear friend, Robert Galloway's father, Sam Galloway Jr., you know, took the city on and demanded the estates basically be put in the control of a private board. You know, it still has to be, it's still owned by the city of Fort Myers, but now the income stream stays with the estates. It doesn't just get sucked into the general fund. And we all know governments, if you have, if, they, if you give them money, they're going to spend it, not necessarily on what they're supposed to. Um, and look, right. to the city's credit, they, 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 they the, the people that were in, you know, the mayor and, and several of the council people in charge agreed that, 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 that we needed to segregate that income stream and we needed to put significant amount of capital dollars to restore the Edison um, estate in particular, the Ford home as well. And so that's what happened. Um, and Mr. Galloway had formed a kind of a private foundation to help raise money for that restoration that was like, look, you privatize, this foundation is going to help contribute towards the restoration. And so they did. And so when they were putting together the, the first board that was going to run the estates, Mr. Galloway's foundation had the ability to appoint someone to the board and they chose me um a because of my long-standing wow. you know history here and and those personal stories and and i mean look you know mr galloway was a uh a mentor i loved him very much he was a, a great man and um and so yeah i've been on the board oh, gosh craig it's probably 20 years now um and uh maybe even a little over 20 years 
and I am I'm the immediate past chairman of the board. I was chairman of the board for three years, um, and we the states have been fully you know restored. We've endured a couple of hurricanes that affected the grounds, but we've recovered from that. Um, we have magnificent leadership under Mike Flanders, who is the the president and executive director of the estates and his team. Uh, all sorts of wonderful educational programming, a very very robust nursery and, and plant sales, and um, and I'm, I'm proud of what has been accomplished in the last 20 years. It, it really is, and it offers something new. You know, before it was like, ah, you know, I've been to the Edison home, and there isn't a whole lot different about it anymore. That, that There's always something new, something different, um, some magnificent programming, concerts, uh, events. Um, they, the, 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 the McGillicuddy family, you, your listeners may know them as Connie Mack. Connie Mack the yep. fourth was actually a, a, a state rep in California mm-hmm. at one point. Um, right. Well, actually, I take that back. He was a state rep in Florida. He married Sonny Bono's um, right. widow, who was a state rep from California. They were both in the in the, in the U.S. Congress right. table. But the Mack family, as you may re- recall, um, Connie Mack um, the first owned the Philadelphia Athletics. Um, and was a uh, was the owner manager of 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 um, you know the the Philadelphia Athletics that spring trained in Fort Myers, and and so the the McGillicuddy or the Mack family as they're known um, accumulated a unbelievable amount of baseball memorabilia over the generations, um, and they had nowhere to display it, and so now very recently opened. Um, in the in the museum at the at the estates, uh, this magnificent baseball memorabilia um, uh, exhibit that's currently going on. I'm so excited to go see it myself. I haven't had the chance yet, but uh, it's on my my short list. Oh, it's, sure. it's very cool. We we were there recently as a family. We we love going down there. It's very very cool. So awesome. I, I'll be honest, until we started researching, I mean, you know, it sounds funny. I'm, we're researching my friend, right? I mean, we're, re, we're doing research to make sure I've got everything that I need to talk about on you. And, and I had no clue that you were involved with, with the, the Edison and Florida States. And, and that is one of my family's favorite things. We're there at least four or five times a year going and walking and just, just enjoying the stuff there. So. Uh, well, well, Frank, listen, man, I, I can't thank you enough. I know that you're busy. I can't thank you enough for spending the time with our listeners, jumping on, sharing things to try to better them and, and, and their abilities to grow their, their business and their interests and, and just to try to protect them and make them better. Um, so, I, again, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. To all our listeners, thank you. Uh, we will see you next week uh, and hope you have a great day. Thank you. Take care. For more information on hard money loans, trustee investing, and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For more information on passive investing through the DBL Capital Real Estate Investment Fund, please visit dblcapital.com. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under the California DRE License 01219911, Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 16236669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab.